Hi, everyone, and welcome to Living Well with Dr. John, Adjustment Through the Lifespan. Today, Dr. John Chang will be interviewing Dr. Linda Schultz, commonly known to the Reef community as Nurse Linda. Now for some background on Dr. John. Dr. John Chang is a clinical psychologist and is board certified in rehabilitation psychology. He is a professor of psychology at East Stroudsburg University, as well as a consulting psychologist. Dr. Chang also has a private practice through Doctors on Demand. One quick note before we start, if you would like to ask a question during the webinar, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now I'm going to turn it over to John. Hi, John. Hey, John. Thank you, Kaylee, for the great intro as always. Hello, listeners. Thank you for coming in and listening to our podcast today. I want to thank the foundation, as always, for allowing me to have a platform to reach some people. Um, also, thank Angela in the foundation for helping us guide us through this process and making sure we're giving the things that the listeners want to hear. So, so here's what I'm thinking today. I, last month, we had incredible amount of questions and, and, and Nurse Linda was so graciously um, able to help me out with the, the talk last month and it was great. And we had so much good feedback from the responses. And after reviewing the materials one more time and knowing that I only covered probably about 5% of all the questions that was asked, I said, you know what, let's do it one more time. Let's get as much as of the questions answered as possible. And, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, it, it will be a, a great uh, information for you. Um, you know, one of the things that I was talking to a nurse Linda prior to the talk to the talk is that I am it is so important for me to make sure I'm doing the right things for you listeners and and right before the talk uh, nurse Linda called it the puke zone and I like that it, it's it's like five minutes of anxiety you get the nervous twitch now you would think as a professor who lectures almost every other day in front of people that I would get used to talking in front of people, but for some reason, it, it never goes away. Um, so you, you still get that few minutes of anxiety and, and uh, self-doubt that, you know, why would anybody want to listen to me today? So, so I had to go through that, get my head going and make sure I, I do the right thing today and get the information I wanted. Um, so sometimes people ask me, you know, you know what, what is it, uh, what is my days like in a sense of uh, working and providing the, the, the podcast and et cetera. And, and I have to tell you, living with a spinal cord injury is, I can't imagine anything more difficult. I, I mean, I hear patients all the time all over the country about this issue, that issue. And back in my head, sometimes I'm thinking, oh my God, I wish I had those issues because it, it the things with us, with individuals with spinal cord injury, uh, for example, you know, a, a, a last month I had to get had to go in for a bladder issue because I was getting all these UTIs. And and tell me, I mean, those who are listening, who um, tell me right on the chat if you ever have issues with UTIs. Now, you know, our talk is living well with Dr. John and the lifespan. And I'll tell you, throughout my 33 years of being an individual with spinal cord injury, I don't think I've ever gone a year without having a, spot, a, a bladder issue. I mean, UTIs has been part of my life all 33 years. Um, it's got, there's, there's been times where it's gotten better. There's times where it's gotten really bad. Um, you know, and you go from cranberry to, to, you know, catheters, to indwelling, to super, you know, my progression for me personally is uh, from an external catheter to an internal catheter to, actually, let me back up. It actually was internal first, right after injury. And then you get excited to go into an external 
to bladder training. And that lasted for many years actually for me. And then, and as I gotten older, and then you go into an internal, then you go into a super pubic, which is a little more functional to use. So, you know, even though I try to do a lot of work, good work for people out there in the real world. Um, and I and I was talking to Kaylee for a little bit. I said, I, I said, you know, I, I'm doing this, this, and she goes, Oh, you're quite busy. And I said, Well, I'm busy because I try to overcompensate for my inadequacies. I try to keep everybody in a fog in the sense of, of saying, look, he's a busy man. But a lot of times, because of the reality is that living with a spinal cord injury, there's so many things about us and about the things I have to do that makes me feel like crap. Um, it, 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 to put it lightly, it just, it, it makes me feel like shit sometimes. And, and so I had to find other things to make me feel better is what I'm saying, because I can't seem to get around not liking this disability at all. So sometimes I have to just find different ways to, to say, look, I do do good things on this side. And maybe that overcompensates for this crap that I have to deal with my bladder and my bowels and, and all those things. Um, so, so to those listeners who ask those questions about, you know, and I thank you for asking, what is it like to live like this at times? It, it's the same as your life. You just got to find ways to, to find good things in your life to get around the bad things that we have to deal with, which progressively as we get older with spinal cord injury, it seems to be getting harder and harder for me. So, um, so I wanted to, to say that. I want to say hi. I want to say thanks for listening. And then, um, and I wanted to bring in our great um, nurse Linda into our, she is a national renowned. She's been in the found, with the foundation for over two decades. She's, I think she's part of the whole foundation itself. So i like to invite nurse Linda in and hello. Hello, John, good, thank you for having to, me. Yeah, my, my pleasure. I thank you again for coming on and participating with our talk today. And uh, so I'd I like to begin with, you know, when I look at all the questions and from last month and actually, and some of the questions from this year, this month, you know, one of the areas we didn't talk about was pain management. You know, I don't know. For me, I'd never, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I don't remember having so much pain. And now in my early 50s and 33 year post, every day I'm, I'm struggling with pain in my neck and my back. Any, any suggestions what we can think about or do for us with this? Well, you know, pain is so insidious and it's very difficult to treat because everybody's pain is different and everybody's pain is perceived differently. So John might have a pain and he might say, well, on a scale of one to 10, it's about a two. I could have the same level of injury, the same type of pain, and I could be saying it's a 20 and it's on a scale of one to 10, you know. So everybody has different interpretations. And, and you know, it varies by day because some days you're feeling better. Some days you're just sick and tired of the pain. And so it, it appears worse, but neuropathic pain is different for everybody. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And it changes. It changes as you get older. It changes the longer you have your injury. Now, the uh, nice thing to hear um, is that neuropathic pain sometimes just goes away. Okay. Uh, yeah, bonus. Yeah. But when you're having the pain, you're like, well, when's that going to happen? Well, you know, no, of course, nobody knows the answers to these questions. But um, so you're saying that one thing, pain is very subjective, you know, it is, it is. It, so, so, so one thing for me that may be very different for someone else with the same injury, same level, but, but they could be experiencing less or more. Um, and but, and this at some times you're saying that it may go away. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes people get on a whole bunch of pain medication and they say, it's just not working anymore. 
And to switch medications, you have to go off one completely before you can go off another, go on another pain medication. And when they get off their pain medication, they're like, wait a minute, I feel better off of it than I felt when I was on it. And that's just the nature of neuropathic pain. It's crazy that way. But there is kind of a hierarchy of treatment where you start out with oral medications, then maybe you move on to some injections, then maybe you move on to like a nerve stimulator to break up the pain as it goes. And, and then there's surgeries that can be done, which you want to, you know, try to avoid because, you know, that whenever you have surgery, that's a big deal for anybody. So that's really something you want to try to avoid, but something you can do for pain which a lot of people forget about is that, you know, bodies are made to move. And when you have a spinal cord injury, moving can be difficult, if not impossible. But the more you can move your body or have someone move your body for you, that provides input to those nerves and muscles below the level of your injury. And, you know, people who go out, you know, runners that grow, go out and people who exercise, they get that runner's high. Yeah, I've been after that high. I have never experienced that. And I would love to experience, but I have never, I have never reached that uh, nerve yeah. on a stage, but, but the more, even the more gently you move your body, the better your body will feel and it will respond in kind. You may not feel it due to your spinal cord injury, but your body will respond to yeah. it and you'll just start to feel a little bit better, but it's got to be gentle exercise, not yeah. a lot of quick jerking but very right, gentle. Right. You know, people with arthritis, they move uh, gently. They say, oh, I don't want to move because my joints hurt. But if they just very slowly and very gently move their bodies, they get a lot of uh, pain relief from that. So yeah. that's something you can try, you know, just yeah. on your own. You know, last month you mentioned about that movement, you know, that exercise constantly moving, moving. And I actually took that to heart because... I used to skip a lot of my stretches in the morning because I want to get up and I got to get, I have work to do and I want to get in my chair because my routine is three hours long and oh God, I hate these three hours every morning. But because you said that, I actually do not skip my stretches anymore. And, 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 I, and I make an effort to, to at least move, you know, get those legs move, moving and moving around. And it has helped a little bit in feeling a little better before I get into my chair. Now, now, a lot of doctors, when I was used to go, well, I still do go to doctors. If I just tell them I'm in pain, they automatically throw me oxycodone. And they're just like, here, have some, or, or um, you know, have a gabapentin, you know, and you know, have these things. It, it's like, it's almost like we can say anything to them and they just, at times, they're lost and they just, they sort of just say, here, just try all these meds and, and you know, Sometimes I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to take too much. Well, that is a concern. And, and a lot of times people do prescribe narcotics for neuropathic pain. And that does absolutely nothing for neuropathic pain. It does not treat it at all. So um, really the medications that affect nerve pain are, like you said, the gabapentin, pregabulin, better known as Lyrica and Neurontin. They're developed specifically for nerve pain, but they have a lot of, they can have side effects as well. Okay. And um, there are other medications that you can take. And, and this you'll appreciate, uh, John, because a lot of people will be offered antidepressants. And the first thing that, oh, I'm not depressed. I don't need that. Yes. An antidepressant at a very low dose can help um, uh, pain control. So uh, that's one of the side effects. So if you do take an, an people who take an antidepressant because they do have depression, have less pain than people who, who don't. Now that doesn't mean, oh, I need to run out and get on antidepressants, but on a very low dose, they do help. The same as uh, seizure medications at a very low dose. The, the depressants and the seizure medications are so low dose that it won't treat seizures and it won't treat depression, but it, those certainly help. So those are the key medications to think about. Um, now, uh, sometimes pain comes from something besides neuropathic pain. It can be from spasticity. Mm -hmm. You get that treated, the spasticity treated, the pain goes away. Now, one of the things that they're looking at now, which I think is helpful, it's not quite uh, 
ready to roll out yet, but they're doing a lot of effort. When they look at things like pain or autonomic dysreflexia or spasticity, these are all things that are controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So they are looking at treating the autonomic nervous system as a unit instead of treating those individual little symptoms that, not little, but the individual symptoms that come from the autonomic nervous system. So it might be in the near future, you might be doing something for your autonomic nervous system system that will affect your uh, autonomic dysreflexia, spasticity, pain, all of those things in a kind of a one-stop shop that won't be so um, hard on your body. You know, a lot of pain medicines, you know, they kind of give you brain fog sometimes. Yeah, they, yeah. You know, yeah. So, you know, things are moving along in the right direction. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, yeah, we're, uh, is, are we having any, some difficulty? Some, some of you let us know if you can't hear us, but, uh, um, so in hearing you that the, so oxycodone may not be a great thing for neurological pain and, and, but some of the, uh, some potential autonomic, you know, medication for autonomic stuff, it may be uh, a good thing in the future. And that sort of carries me over to a little bit of autonomic dorsiflexia because AD, because, uh, you know, and please tell me if I'm wrong, Linda, is that, you know, as I've gotten older, I've noticed that that's gotten worse. You know, that uh, I used to be able to tolerate a lot of pain and nothing would change. Now, a simple um, twist in my super pubic and, and if the bladder's not flowing right, bang, my blood pressure is over 190 and over 200. And, you know, and I'm struggling to make sure that thing comes down. So, you know, it, I guess that's still part of the process of just getting your body used to some of this pain and experience that. Am I, uh, what do you think? Well, uh, definitely. And, and as a person ages with a spinal cord or without a spinal cord, everything becomes more difficult. So, you know, you, uh, as you get older, your muscles may not be as strong as they used to be. Your breathing might not be as good as it used to be. Um, pain control is a little more difficult. You know, our bodies just, you know, tend to wear out as we get older. And unfortunately, these things happen. Now, there's still treatments for it, but again, you know, it's, it's, it's a consequence of aging. Also, um, the longer that you had a spinal cord injury, it seems like people collect more issues, but you know, that goes along with aging, but also with that on top of having a spinal cord injury. So things just add up and pile up more as you, you know, it's just a natural part because the body has the brain is still working. It's still trying to send those signals. And the more signals it tries to send that don't get through and the brain's like, I'm sending you these signals. Why aren't you doing these things? So things, things uh, tend to pile up. On the other hand, the good news, there's always you know the bad news and the good news. On the other hand, your body is always trying to repair itself. You know, we know about skin turns over and, you know, you lose thousands of skin cells every day, but new ones are always coming up. Skin turns over really quickly because it's exposed to the outside environment. So it needs to react more quickly. The central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord are always trying to repair itself. So back in college, when you would hear that expression, oh, I'm going to go out, I'm going to drink all this beer, and I'm going to lose these brain cells, and they're never coming back. Well, guess what? Yes, they are coming back, but, but they're coming back at a very, very, very slow rate. And so we're trying to figure out ways to accelerate that birth of new nervous system cells. So the body is always trying to repair itself. And one of the things that it will do, and in the Christopher Reeve recovery project, one of the things that we found was that when uh, he would have his functional MRI, so he'd have an MRI of his, of his head, mm -hmm. and they would note where the movement pattern was in his brain. So where you would expect it to be, some of those movement patterns had moved to another part of the brain because the brain was trying to compensate. And so all of, all of, this, all of this comes together. So 
again, I, I go back to activity or movement. His recovery plan was based on activity and movement, and that certainly helped accelerate, accelerate some of this brain remapping and refunctioning. Yeah. So, you know, and listeners, give me a little chat on if you have problems with AD as well as like I do. But so in hearing you, Linda, is that, you know, it's, I, I like what you said about as you grow older and the fact that, you know, just growing older, you have, you know, as a gerontologist myself, you have these long-term effects of, you know, high blood pressure or chronic illness or diabetes, you know, things that are, or sitting in a wheelchair like myself, having osteoporosis, you know, things over time just takes its toll. And, and that's just part of aging, I guess, is what you're saying. You, you well, can't. and a, a perfect example of that has been in this COVID and the people who are most susceptible to COVID are people who are of older age, mm -hmm. because one of the autonomic nervous system's jobs is to regu regulate the immune system of the body. So uh, as you get older and that immune system gets more challenged, then you become more susceptible to things like COVID. You become more susceptible to things like urinary tract infection and you know autonomic dysreflexia just because of the changes, natural changes in the body that things aren't happening as speedily as they used to. And we see that in all individuals who are older or more susceptible to COVID. I noticed there were some comments in the chat box about uh, UTIs. And we always say, well, you know, if you, if you follow your technique and you're very careful and you can avoid UTIs and you can avoid UTIs, you need to be careful with your technique. But part of the issue is also that autonomic nervous system is not responding as quickly as it used to. And who has a quick autonomic nervous system versus somebody who doesn't have such a quick one with spinal cord injury that we don't know. We can't look at somebody and say, well, your autonomic nervous system has slowed down. So, um, so some people are just more prone. They do doing everything right. And you shouldn't be blaming yourself. It could be your autonomic nervous system. Isn't just zipping along to create those antibodies to fight off those urinary tract infections. Right. You know, and, and, and listeners, I know we're talking about a lot of medical stuff that, that we have to be exposed to and, and we got to work through, but I, I don't want to give you the impression that life is, is completely um, sad and despair. There's a lot of good things. And, and part of the good thing that uh, what nurse Linda is doing and, and myself is that we're trying to give you all the information that you can help use to prevent a whole bunch of things first, maybe. And then, and another reason why we're doing this is, you know, it helps us live with what we have with the right information. And, you know, knowing that oxycodone does not work with neuropathic pain, knowing that she mentioned that exercise, even passive exercise is great for us. You know, I thought I knew a lot, but man, I'm still getting things every time I talk to her. So I'm glad I'm able to pick her brains. So, um, you know, in, in a review of the questions again, uh, Nurse Linda, some of the, there's a big part on sociological, but what I say relationship parts. Um, there's so much at times changes with our relationship with our spouse, with our parents, with our parents, with our children. It, it, it's impossible to not have some impact on every relationship out there. And, and I'll start with by saying, look, I remember when I broke my neck on 19 and my mother had to do my routine every day for the first three months home. And I, I sit back and I think about, I said, my gosh, she was, she was about early forties when she took care of me at that time, uh, you know, transferring me in and out and, uh, the, and you know, obviously, like most mothers, she just stepped it up and and did what she had to do as a and and and, she, and listeners, tell me if you have a great mom like that. Um, you know, they, they just step it up, they just do the job, and, and they don't complain. Now, to to I had had so much guilt at that time. I remembered that I said to myself after three months being home, I was like, I gotta get back to college. 
I got to get back to college full time. I live on campus and I'd rather, I'd rather live on campus and, and suffer through that than to have to have, you know, mom having to, to take care of me all day and night. But, but what are your thoughts on, on some of these, the impact on relationships? On Austin, you know, it's in, in over these 20 years that you've been around individuals with spinal cord injury. Well, I tell you, you see all kinds of things in relationships. You have some people who, like you say, John, are just marvelous family members, spouses, um, even uh, uh, neighbors that will step up and just help out. And that's that's great. And they do everything and they really pay attention and, and really work hard. And then you have other people that are a little bit more reluctant and reluctant is okay because you know everybody needs to come to this in their own time. So sometimes you can't expect somebody just to say, oh, goody, I get to do this. You know, I'm so excited. Um, and you have to remember too that they're going through their own grief and mourning period because especially parents, it doesn't matter if you were, if they were with you or if you were out on your own and you became injured, a parent's going to think, oh, it's all my fault in some way. So they carry a lot of guilt with themselves um, as well, spouses sometimes as well. And then there are other times that family members really just can't handle the situation at all. And, and it's, it's really disappointing to the person who's had the injury. It's disappointing even sometimes to themselves mm -hmm. that they're just not able to step up and do it. So you see the whole spectrum of all kinds of things, of relationships. Yeah. It's a real challenge. Yes, yes. You know, it, it sounds like, you know, from a psychological perspective, there's guilt everywhere. Everyone seems to have guilt. You know, I'm having guilt because I broke my neck. Mom's having guilt because she made mom or dad maybe because they didn't protect me enough or, or some aspect of it or seeing me struggle every day. A spouse has to do a routine or fiance um, because their relationship no longer is just a spouse. Now it's a caregiver slash spouse, which is, you know, I, I see it. Uh, I went through it with my spouse and I, and I'm, and I have to realize, geez, I made a lot of mistakes the first time I was married. Trust me. I did. Cause I didn't know what, what I was doing. I didn't know how to handle my, my sense of guilt and my lack of don't want to be a burden on others. And I think I figured it out. I hope, I hope, I, I don't know, maybe I didn't sometimes, but I hope I figured that out. Um, what, so what, what about parents of children with this disability? You know, we, we had a few questions last time and, and I wanna make sure I covered that a little bit more in detail. You know, it seems to me that, you know, the health of, based on what I've read and what I've researched, uh, in literature that the health of the mother, the health, the mental health of the caregiver is so critical in a child's adjustment. What do you think about that? Well, you know, kids pick up on um, what their parents, the mood of the parents, kids pick right up on that. Um, if mom or dad's upset, kids know right away. And if mom and dad sometimes um, can feel guilty or the caregiver of the child can feel guilty about it, about what's going on and they think, oh, you know, you can't uh, toilet, you have to catheterize or you have to do a bowel program or, you know, you have these unique needs and I feel so badly about that. So I'll just do that for you. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and, and John, I, you, I know you'll have thoughts about this as well, but I think that parents who can ex accept, they don't have to like, mm -hmm. but who can accept that these are the things that need to be done so that the child learns to become independent. I mean, that's the role of a, our, that's our job as parents is to get our children to be independent and to make things normal for that child. So, you know, a parent who is, perceives catheterization as an abnormal thing and I must protect my child and I'll do this from them. I won't even make them look while I do it or, you know, all these kind of protective mechanisms are really kind of harming the child because this is their normal. Little kids who are born with, um, with neurological issues, they don't know the world any different. And so catheterization is normal to them. 
And when they go to school and find out that other kids aren't catheterizing, they become very alarmed that the other kids don't do this because what's going to happen to their bladders, <laughs> you know, and, and it's kind of, um, you know, it's kind of a reverse kind of thing, but to be able to raise your child to be independent and that, that can be a tough, a tough yeah. act. And, you know, there's constantly things that with developmental stages, there's constantly something going on. So kids become a certain age and they're going to t-ball practice and your child is not going to t-ball practice. And how can you, you know, incorporate these different activities, these um, passages of childhood into your child's life? So in, in hearing what you're saying is that it's one, whatever the child's physical responsibility that they need, if it's catheterization, if it's, if it's bowel management, you have to accept that this is the norm for them. And so the quicker the parents sort of say, this is part of your independence, it sort of translates them to accepting it quicker as well. Absolutely. Kids, and, well, kids even teenagers to a point, will uh, mimic the behaviors of their adult parents because, you know, that's just the way it is. So, um, but you, you know, people don't have to like it. Accepting it and liking it are two different things. So sometimes people think, oh, I accept it. That means I don't think anymore about it. Or I just, you know, I don't know. Somehow they think it's different. You just have to accept the challenge and rise to the challenge, but you don't have to you know, like, like the situation. Right, right. Um, I guess parenting sort of parenting of someone in a wheelchair, a child in a wheelchair, or parenting a person that is able body with without physical, it's almost the same thing. You have to, at times, give tough love, in some ways, you're saying. You, you have mm -hmm. to give them the opportunity to be independent and give them the opportunity to fail and try to get them to a point of becoming more independent. Um, right. So I'm hearing right. from you. you know, one of the things, I, and, I, and I'm stepping back a little bit because I, I remember one of the questions I, you and I talked about briefly one time was, and was caregivers. And I, and I think of parents as caregivers, but I also think of, you know, when you're hiring caregivers, I remember one of our, our listeners asked, you know, they said, you know, I am so embarrassed and I remember going through this and I remember thinking about, oh my God, I got to show them the bowel routine. How do I, you know, how do I talk about digital STEM? How do I even approach that when I'm interviewing people? You know, what are your thoughts about when you hire people or hire um, individuals that to help take care of you? And there's a lot of embarrassing things that we have to teach. Well, you know, th that, yes, it's very hard because, you know, how many people in their daily lives talk about bowels in general, you know, that, that's a verbal, you know, we don't, we don't discuss those kind of things. And, and there's some things that we shouldn't be talking about just, you know, like you see so many ads on TV for different things. And it's like, really seriously, is that what we want um, out there? There's, you know, it's not anything wrong with talking about it, but you know, do you, do you want that as a part of your everyday conversation? Probably not. So I think the more that you can be organized with knowing exactly what you need, you know, some people have a spinal cord injury and they've gone from the rehab hospital, somebody's done their care and they're really not sure what goes on in that bowel program because they haven't done it themselves. But the more organized you can be and the more specific you can be in a job description, you can't possibly get every single item, you know, there's that old joke about the job description, the last item is and other duties as a sign because that leaves the door open. But the more you can uh, be prepared if you have um, uh, like a discharge instruction sheet from the hospital or you can go online, you can go to the ReFoundation and here's the steps to a bowel program. Here's the bowel program book. This is everything that must be done and give information and say, this is what I have, to, I have to have happen. And then, you know, as the person accepting the job, either they say, okay, I will do these things. Or if they say, well, I'm not going to do uh, digital STEM. I know somebody was saying um, that they had a hard time because their caregiver said, well, 
we're just not going to, we, I'm not going to do the digital STEM part. And so they were trying to figure out a way to do their bow program without it. Well, that doesn't work. And so they were running into all different kinds of things because they were trying to accommodate a paid caregiver. So in reality, if you as about things, checking in, capitalization, bow program, turning, these are all the things that need to happen. And maybe even here's a schedule of my day. This has to happen at this time. This has to happen at that time. You know, a lot of healthcare professionals, especially if you work in the hospital, nurses work on a priority system. Therapists work on a time schedule system. So sometimes even in institutions, there's conflicts because the therapist will say, well, I need to have this patient ready um, at nine o'clock up and dress so that we can practice mobility training. Or the occupational therapist will say, I need to have this patient ready at eight o'clock so that they're ready to go into the shower because we're gonna practice bathing. But nurses are working on the floor. They're looking up and down the floor. Oh, I need to do a catheterization on this person now. Oh, I need to uh, give somebody their anti-seizure medications at this time or we're gonna have trouble down the way. So sometimes when you get nursing oriented people, they're used to working on priorities. So you need to be very clear about what needs to happen at what specific time. And it's not, a, it, that is the priority. And specifically all the activities that go with the bowel program, this is the way it has to happen. And so, you know, you're, especially if you're paying somebody um, your health, if you're not paying somebody, your health will determine, you know, what needs to be done or what shouldn't be left out. But you need to just be very clear and have it very specific, as specific as you can. So, and hearing, what I'm hearing from you is that you know, is have a real appropriate expectation before you hire them that these are the things I require. Uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, try not to hire someone in, in with, without them knowing the details of your or your needs, and and sounds like if you try to get around it in some ways, it's not very healthy, obviously. Um, but I but you know I I do sometimes think that thinking back of my my life and all the thirty some years of of hiring and, and firing and caregivers, you know, so it's sometimes you get great people, sometimes you don't, but sometimes you don't have a choice. It's because you're limited with it, especially during COVID right now. And then those yes. of you who are listening, you know, it's, it's put in the chat if you have ever had the experience of having to just hire people because you just had to, you know, because there was no one else around to, to help out. And, and um, so that's always a frustration as well. Um, but, but again, prioritizing, telling people, the nurses or the caregivers, these are the things I have to do and when and, and well, seems the best bet. I think if you can be as clear as you can be, and if, you know, it is your body, even though you might not be doing these particular activities, somebody else is doing it to you, but it is your body. So you should know what's going, you have to be in control of your body. So you need to tell people this is exactly the way it needs to be done. And sometimes now a caregiver might be doing something with you and they might say, you know, I've noticed if we do it this way, it seems to be a little bit easier for you. You can certainly take advice. You know, you don't have to be so rigid that, you know, that, that uh, you, you don't listen to what anybody else says, but you need to be rigid enough to say, and, it, and it's hard for people because not everybody is uh, direct. Some people are more try to get along and, you know, don't want to cause any kind of waves or upset. And when you're working with somebody, you don't want to upset them that they don't come back, that they don't come back and help you and you're left high and dry like people have been in this COVID uh, situation. Uh, people, uh, caregivers just left. They just disappeared and, and people were left high and dry. And that's just a mess. Of course, there's been a lot of things that are just a mess. Yeah, that, that is so scary. Um, to, you know, my, my biggest fear up in here in the northeast corner in Pennsylvania up here was snow and that if there's a snowstorm, if my caregivers are going to get in. And um, that was always, that was always my fear when, you know, I used to, 
uh, be single. And I was just like, oh my God, are they going to, and, and I would call the, and try to, you know, to touch base with them to say, are you going to come in? Are you going to be, able, if you can't get in here at seven o'clock, you know, in the morning, can you get in here at least nine or whatever, you know, once the roads are plowed, because I don't want to be laying in bed all day, you know, and, um, but that would, you know, that would be my fear. And, and as you know, I wouldn't get a good night's sleep that, that night because of just, just the weather. So for those who live in Arizona and those who live in Florida, I wish I was back down there. I wish because I, you don't have to deal with snow, at least most of the time. I can't say Texas, though, because they, they just went through crazy freezing. So uh, but Florida and Arizona. So, um, you know, one of the questions and, and I'm, I'm jumping a little bit to uh, spouses and caregivers being your caregivers, I, you know, that is such a difficult balance, I noticed, because it, it, sometimes they are your caregivers, even though they're your spouse, they're giving you caregiving issues and, 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 and it's almost, you, and you have to treat them almost at times like a caregiver. And other times you hope that you can have relationships where it's more spousal and, and more in, intimate and romantic and, and, and you have to compartmentalize a little bit. It's mm -hmm. very difficult to, to look at your spouse, you know, while you're doing your bowel routine for three hours and you're doing your digital stim. It, I know it, you try to make fun of it at times. And, and those of you who have a three hour routine like I do in the morning, it, and your spouse is doing it, it's like, okay, I'm trying to make it a light part of it, but it is not light. It is, it's, it's heavy. It's, it's frustrating. It's at times difficult. And you know what I do out there listeners? I, I, sometimes I just have to say, Hey, thank you for, you know, helping me get up today and, and, and just showing that little appreciation sometimes because they don't hear it too. Uh, to be honest on their side, you're doing it because they love you. And, so you need to make an effort at times to just say thank you. You know, I appreciate you getting me up because I know it's not a, an easy thing at times. And then, so that's that little guilt also that you have to worry about yourself, but you yeah. have to at least show that you appreciate what they do for you. And when you are not doing caregiving and you have times to be a little bit more uh, intimate or uh, and romantic, you have to jump on those times because it's, it's it, it, you know, those are really far in between Although we had a talk on one of the months, sexuality, it's completely different. It's not the same as that before your injury. Um, so I'm not even going to go there right now because we could spend another year on sexuality uh, as, as we talked about a few months ago. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about coping and for and Linda, one of the things that in your 20 years experience, you know, I'm going to, and, and listeners, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about how to cope. And, and I got some great answers from people about how they cope, but in your 20 years of exposure with all the individuals with spinal cord injury, and you've been around actually a lot of people who have actually been very successful. A lot of people who work at the foundation, a lot of people who probably ran into you. What do you think is a, some of the things they do to cope with the injury? What, what, do you have any thoughts on that, on, on the way they cope and, and some of the things you may have picked up, maybe a little bit more psychological, I guess. I'm um, putting you on the spot here. Well, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking as you were asking that, and I was thinking, gosh, there's so many different ways. Like you mentioned, people at the foundation, you know, some people find a lot of um, uh, strength in helping others. And I see individuals on the ReFoundation community mm -hmm. that will chime in on different situations and what they've done. And it's so helpful when you, you know, like I can say things because I've seen a lot and, and that gives me a certain amount of street cred. Mm -hmm. um, I can, I know certain things uh, from being a caregiver of someone with spinal cord injury that gives me another different kind of street uh, but people on the community that write in or they volunteer in different organizations and they're helping people adjust they go visit in the hospital 
you you do have to be careful um, sometimes when people are helping you in a pure sort of way because there are some people. Um, well, I, I I'm going to just say there was one particular incident where a fellow would come into the hospital and he was a counselor. Uh, for people who had spinal cord injury and and one day I went on rounds at the end of the day just to, before I leave I'd go check how everybody was doing and everybody was just like so upset and so crying I'm like what's the matter what happened today I mean everybody is just all upset and they're like well so and so was here today oh he had such a sad story and how dare do you know I I complain because I have a spinal cord injury and and here the and here what this guy was doing was his method of helping other people was to come in and tell his story and get all the attention focused on him. And it just made everybody, you know, it was really depressing for everybody. And, you know, as a peer counselor, you want people that are going to come and, and lift you a little bit and, and see, you know, like you, John, you're being successful. And I think anybody who survived a spinal cord injury from trauma or from disease they are successful and they have valuable things to say. Even if you've just had an injury for a day or if you've been injured for years and years and years, you have all this valuable information that people like me can see, we can hear about, but we don't know what it's like day after day after day. We can empathize, but we can't know what it's like uh, to be sitting in that chair where you are, you know, so all that is very important. So that's, that's one way of coping. Um, other people use destructive me measures like telling people off and um, just being generally obnoxious, you know, and then how many caregivers want to approach you when you know you're going to be sworn at or spit on or whatever. So, you know, those kind of, some people cope by um, using detrimental behaviors like um, alcohol or drug use, and they escape in that way, which is, you know, not helping their physical self, and it's not helping the people who are trying to help them. So I think that trying to, um, like you say, be kind to other people, pay it forward. Uh, some people get busy. I know as a coping mechanism, whether you have a spinal cord injury or not, I know my coping mechanism is I like to work. So I'll just work, 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 work. And that fills my mind. Mm -hmm. And I have to think about myself or my troubles because I'm, I'm either being productively working or, you know, some people, again, helping other people. All those are good skills to have. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I like that one. Fill your mind with stuff because that I seem to do a lot of that as well. Just to, and sometimes it distracts me from, from the things mm -hmm. I don't want to think about. And, um, you know, you know, again, the, the fact that you were a caregiver of someone, you know, so that gives you credit for being a caregiver of, it, it is true. It, it's it, when you haven't lived it, sometimes it's hard to understand it. And, and those of you out there who are, you know, who are in a wheelchair, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about is that. It's a, when, when I'm around people with, with a disability, when I'm hanging out with my spinal cord friends, there's a connection that's there that's, that I don't have to even talk about. You know, when I, when I used to play rugby for the Philadelphia and, or, and, or, or I'm just hanging out with another uh, person in the wheelchair, uh, we, there's, there's an understanding and we go from there. And, and a lot of times it's just, it's just making a lot of fun of each other, to be honest. And, and we all need friends like that. Um, so that type of support is obviously good. You know, one of the things that I know is that when I, when we ask people, how do you cope with the spinal cord injury? Man, it's amazing. It, it, people start rattling off of all the things that I would probably teach you in therapy, you know, and Linda's probably have heard these things many times, but, but I'm going to, I want to go over a, a few of them with you. Um, but the, Exercise is what Linda said one time. She said, move, move, move. Um, mm -hmm. I agree with you. You know, being And it helps your skin and your bowel and it helps those bladder. A lot of people wrote in about bladder infections. If you're moving, you're shaking that bladder, your bladder infections are numbers are going to go down. Yeah. So so I, I'm I, so I've been doing more of that since Linda said that last month. And and just to keep my body moving and mode, because I sit here in this computer, I'm on on the computer screen almost all day, either teaching or research. 
And, you know, I, so I'm making it a little worse in my life because I'm just sitting around like a lard. Um, you know, the other thing of coping is I, I hear also in is having uh, good hobbies, things to distract you, uh, things to to keep your, you know, your thoughts about something else and, um, you know, to have another different type of goals. So um, one of the hobbies I took, uh, told Kaylee to this morning is that after 33 years, I want to learn how to play video games again. You know, and there's, there's actually a lot out there out there, but I want to be able to play video games. I want to drive those cars. I want to be one of those military guys that go around um, and shooting bad people and, uh, you know, with these quad sticks and stuff. So, <laughs> so that has distracted my life a little bit. Um, and some, so some people said hobbies. Um, so for me, I'm gonna, I want to get back to video games. Um, problem solving, you know, Linda, I think throughout almost both sessions, she mentioned about just figuring out how to problem solve different. Everybody does things differently, she said, right? And so you need to figure out what works for you. And I'm gonna apologize. I got this sun coming in right into my screen here. I'm gonna, uh, you know, and it's almost in my eyes here. But uh, so again, um, exercise, hobbies, uh, problem solving, trying to make sure your bowel routine uh, works for you and, and makes it that, what do you do with those three hours? Now, unfortunately, the people, I ha hate to say it, I went from uh, having the digital stim to the point of getting a colostomy at, at this point in my life. And when I read the information, on, and you tell me, Linda, when I was reading the information about having a major surgery right now, everybody, whoever got it, kept saying, I don't know why I waited so long to get it. And I kept saying, thinking, why would everybody want, what, what, I mean, is this thing really that good to go from a digital stim to a colostomy? I hate to say it, but it has saved my life in a lot of ways because I'm not sitting on a toilet three hours and having hemorrhoids and, you know, all those issues of blood and all that stuff. You know, what is your exposure experience with people who have colostomies, you know, and in, 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 as they just and get older, you know, with their bowel issues? Well, that certainly is an alternative. And we really like to save colostomies to the last resort kind yeah. of thing. Um, one is that surgery uh, with a high level of spinal cord injury or with any spinal cord injury has a lot more risk than for the, for the uh, average person because of breathing issues and getting off the ventilator and all that. Yes. I, I know we have done it and it cost me a uh, surgery could make it um, easier on their care. It is easier on themselves, but they, you know, I don't want to ask people to do So they have clost me and I have no people that have died because they got a clost me or, um, you know, or they had hemorrhoid surgery and they, you know, died from these things. Um, now that human birth, you know, without risk. And so you really need to think about those things. Now, I will tell you quite frankly, in my, uh, well, be 45 years this year of being a registered nurse, the bowel program is pretty much the same. Um, Oh, and can you hear me now? I think people are saying I'm having trouble. I think it, whatever it is, has cleared up. So uh, colostomy is usually safe for a last resort uh, because it's, it can be a dangerous surgery for people with spinal injury. But um, in the 45 years of being a nurse, I can tell you the way that we learned to do bowel programs when I first started is the way that bowel programs are being done today. So the progress in bowel programs has been like, yeah. I can. Now, one thing that has helped is um, something that has developed along the way is the development of the mini enema. And mm -hmm. some people are um, uh, switching from suppositories 
uh, to the mini anima for people who have higher level injuries. Success with those, and they like. So I think I think you have to you know really think about and consider what kinds of outcomes. I know people who I I know people who take six to eight hours to do a bowel program. That's way out of hand. Wow. They think it's way out of hand. the bowel. Okay. Well, so there are things that you, you can yeah. trying to um, get that uh, bowel to move. Back. Guess what? Wayne, the main thing is, you know what it is, activity, because when we walk, that's what helps move our bowels. So the more you can move your legs, that helps. And, you know, following a, a diet with um, uh, fresh foods rather than foods, looking at all those little things. One of the things that has changed in the guidelines, we used to say at fiber laxative, you know, use that amusal or the citrusyl or, or those kind of things. It's amount of water to get those to work because they draw the water out of the bowel to make the stool go through. So if you're on a intermittent catheterization program, you can't drink that amount of water. Mm -hmm. In the hospital, I see people get Metamucil and put it in a little tiny Dixie cup and You've got to get eight ounces of water to get that to flush through. So one of the things that they're backing away from with the higher level injuries is the metamucil. They're still using it in the lower level injuries. But in the higher level injuries, they're backing away, away from that. So, um, you know, because it, it's, it's making the stool harder rather than softer if you can't take the water in. So we are learning more things. We are advancing more things, but... What, what we want is the body to stay as um, functional as it possibly can be. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, hey, you know, and so colostomies, last resort, do you know, it sounds like there are a lot of potential issues that you, uh, you know, you can get from that, from death even. So mm -hmm. cautious, make sure you've gone through all the, and, and I did as well, I had the hemorrhoid, hemorrhoid you know, a surgery and all these things to try to, avoid a certain aspect of our routine that I hate. And I know so I can't imagine anyone enjoying morning uh, your routines, your bowel routines, even at in the morning or night. Um, but like you said, there's activities, a diet and some and some healthy things like Metamucil and, and laxatives, uh, Miralax that can help move things along. Um, and if, you, if you have a lower level injury, there are, uh, there's a, an implant and, you know, they're doing more and more with these electrical stimulation. If you yep. have lower level injury, they can attach electrodes to the peripheral nerves and you can have a bowel movement. You can have a, uh, you can pass urine. Uh, it helps men with um, uh, erectile abilities. So there are things that are available if you have a lower level injury because it's peripheral nerves. They can move the peripheral nerves, move one that works to an area where it doesn't work, but that's only in the peripheral nerve, not in the spinal cord. Are you, are you saying like a stimulator mm -hmm. that, that, you, that you just flip yeah. a switch? Yeah. Wow. wow. That's for, that's great. You just flip a switch and boom, you know, you're lucky, you get lucky, right? Yeah. That is, that's <laughs> that's wonderful. I've not yeah. heard of that before. So, so unfortunately, she, 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 she put a clause on it. She said, lower level injury. Right. So those but now with the, with the epidural stimulation, more success with bowel and bladder and such. Uh, we're, we're, we are losing you again, Linda. Um, it, it's locking up. So, you know, uh, we're, and we're getting close to the end of our, our talk. So, um, as she is frozen in space for now, one of the things I, I've noticed is that uh, obviously our last two months has been emphasized on a lot more medical stuff. I haven't been integrating too many psychological issues and how to live with this and with some of the, and there's been a, a significant amount of people who've asked, you know, you know, what do I do to about the loneliness, the isolation and coping? And I'm gonna elaborate more of that on that when I get when I talk to you um, about that in more of a psychological perspective. Um, but for, for those of you listeners, 
I want, I want to leave you with something to think about. So I'm actually going to ask you a favor. I'm going to ask you some, some of your um, suggestions. When you fill out the recommendation, I want you to give me some suggestion for, um, for something I'm working on. So I was hurt when I was 19. And, and I, I don't, you guys have not heard of the story. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk more about that down the road about the student I had that her mother ended up being one, uh, one of the people that was on the beach when I was hurt um, 30 years ago, which was an irony of that. But my goal now, oh, thanks, Linda. We're so, I'm sort of wrapping things up here. So the question I have for the listeners that you may get, so I need to, I actually drowned in the ocean on that August 22nd, 1986. So I am gonna try to find the people who actually saved me. I figured I better do that soon because they're going to get too old and they're going to die on me before I get to say thank you. So if you have any suggestions on how I can even figure that out um, and see who, who uh, actually saved my life, put it on the comments, you know, when you, you know, write the evaluations and give me some suggestions and heads up. So, but so those are some of the things I'm working on. Uh, but if not, I will see you next month. Um, we will figure out what we're going to talk about. And uh, thank you for listening today on Living Well with Dr. John. Thank you, Dr. Linda Schultz. I appreciate your friendship and, and you being on and sharing your incredible knowledge with us today. Um, and Thanks for having me, John. Thank you again. And listeners, thank you for listening. And please let your friends know about our talk podcast and uh, more we share this, the better it is for us and the foundation because we want to educate others. Thank you. Live well. Take care. Bye-bye.